So this is the last uh, recording or lecture in gas power systems. We've covered a lot of territory, but basically I just want to talk about nozzles. Uh, we are familiar with the converging nozzle, but there is a converging, diverging nozzle. That's what's essential. That's what's needed if you want to get the speed of the flow greater than the speed of sound, which is very interesting to me. This is very interesting. So here's a picture of space shuttle with three main engines as they help power the shuttle into space. So these are the three engines on the shuttle that are firing. And the engine's exhaust is going Mach 10. Mach 10 coming out the back. That is impressive. And uh, you can see some diamond shocks. I am not a shock expert but they would be where you're uh, releasing the gases and the, uh, as you get higher in altitude, the rocket will be burning the same, but the exhaust pressure will be less. It'll be better to match. It's too high of exhaust pressure at the ground. And so you're having some shocks, oblique shocks inside the nozzle, which are coming out and they're forming. And I'll have an illustration on it, so let's press forward. But that is impressive Mach 10. So this is the basics. You have the oxidizer and the fuel on board. You have a high pressure region due to the combustion, but it's not flowing very fast, is it? You put it through a diverging section to get it to speed up until it becomes sonic. So it's at this speed point where up to that point, it's from slow to the speed of sound at that temperature. And then you put it through a diverging section to make it even go faster. Most people would say, no, you want a nozzle to make it go faster? Make it smaller, 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 such that you have a really small outlet. But that's not the way the physics works. All right, so now you're going to make it go larger in cross-sectional area. The velocity will continue to increase above the speed of sound, and it will exit at low pressure. If the pressures don't match, then you could have shocks. Okay. Basic equation, exhaust speed times the mass flow rate gives you thrust in newtons. Don't forget that, please. And here it is true that it's just the mass flow rate and the exit velocity because there's no inlet velocity of the gases. And if you want more thrust, what do you do to the exhaust speed? Get it above sonic speed. Get it to Mach 10. That will throw it out well, for the same mass flow rate. If this exhaust speed gets higher than the speed of sound, it's better. That's why you have a converging, diverging uh, nozzle. There's some other websites with a lot to be read, but uh, I'm going to talk about this equation that's in red right here. And that equation has in it m for the Mach number right there. It has how the velocity changes compared to its current velocity thinking about one-dimensional flow out the, the uh, uh, nozzle, and how it's related to the change in the area compared to the current area. So this equation is a combination of other equations. I'm going to have a quick der derivation of it, but on this one slide, they show you the derivation, which basically says we're going to take conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, or because here there's no net forces, it's conservation of momentum, Isentropic, so that would be like the second law, entropy is equal to z change in entropy zero. And then combine this one with that one, then combine that one with that one, and before you know it, you have a unique equation. It's highly mathematical, and then we'll interpret that equation, but they're, all, they're telling you right here. It behaves different if it's subsonic versus supersonic, and that's a key. So this nozzle is uh, typically given the name De Laval nozzle or converging diverging nozzle. And uh, it was um, studied, I'm sure, by him when they recognized him as contributing in this area. I don't have a picture of him at all, but you could find it on the internet, I'm sure. But it's in supersonic jet nozzles, in rocket nozzles, even in steam turbines. You could get the speed higher than the speed of sound in the steam. So there's a number of applications, not just in propulsion. <coughs> so we take this nozzle equation. Here it is. And we rewrite it like this. 
So we're talking about the change in the velocity compared to the instantaneous velocity. And the velocity is always positive because you're 1D going down. You're not changing direction in the nozzle. And you're going to have the change in the area compared to the area. Now, the area is always positive, just like the velocity is always positive. I don't have a negative area to flow through. But we can have it speed up. That would be dV is increasing. Or slow down, dV is decreasing. You could have dA increasing. That's a diverging nozzle. Or you could have dA decreasing. It would be converging nozzle. Well, the multiplier is very interesting. It's 1 over the Mach number squared minus 1. That multiplier can change sign depending on what m is. Do you see this? What happens to this if the Mach number is less than 1? That's our traditional. That's what we have a lot of sense. It makes sense to us. It's, it's, it's not sonic speed. You know, If the Mach number is less than 1, what about this coefficient? It's <coughs> It's negative. So that says that if I have a negative times a negative, then I have a positive, meaning that if the area goes down, I multiply that by another negative, then the velocity goes up. But what happens if the Mach number is greater than 1? That coefficient in front is positive. And there is the mind warp. That's what's really startling, is that hold it. If I now let the area go up, I multiply that by a negative, I'm sorry, now a positive, right? So a positive times a positive gives me a positive. So to, in order for it to speed up, I need to give it more room, not less room. Somebody asked me, can you explain that on a physical basis? Nope. I'm honest. I just am not an expert in compressible flow. But I've also asked some compressible flow experts if they can explain it to me. And I've never yet gotten a good explanation on a physical basis. Leave the math out. I don't want to see an equation. I can understand momentum. I can understand mass. I can understand energy. I could talk about the molecular you know, things of the molecules. Just give me that type of third grade description of it. And I hate to say it. I wish I could give it to you maybe next semester. The next students, I'll be able to explain it better. But it has to do something with, on the ideal gas, think a little billiard ball models, and now they're going to be all just sort of scooting in that direction, and they're scooting so fast that they're <laughs> the, the speed of uh, propagation of a pressure wave, they're faster than that. So I don't understand it, honestly. That's, 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 that's the best I can do. But here it is. If you have a subsonic conditions, this is a nozzle. This is a diffuser. The area is increasing in the diffuser. The area is decreasing, but it switches. Whenever you get the supersonic, the whole world flips. And if I want to make it go faster, give it more room. And if I want to slow it down, choke it. What? Yep, just the opposite. So where did that equation come from? Well, we already outlined it on that NASA slide. Here it is in one slide. This is the best I can do for not going to multiple slides to der derive this equation. You have a mass balance, and then you, you have the, uh, the continuity, and you do use a little calculus to get how a change in density and a change in area and a change in velocity, but they can all three change, but guess what? They all can't change independently. The sum in this equation must be zero because of the mass balance. So you have an energy balance. This looks familiar. Enthalpy plus kinetic energy is constant no matter what. We can't produce or destroy energy. So I have great confidence in a mass balance and an energy balance. We can rewrite it as a little differential change in enthalpy and then negative VdV for a change in velocity, but that's always true. Then we have entropy balance. Well, it's isentropic. That's our assumption. When we get to shocks, it's not isentropic across the shock. That's what's so special about shocks. But we have pretty good isentropic flow through the rest of the nozzle. And so here is how dH and dP change. They're related. So now we just take this equation coming from entropy, 
And this equation coming from energy, and we eliminate the enthalpy change, and we get a new relation. We recall a state principle, like pressure is a function of density and entropy, so that we can write from calculus the change in the pressure related to a change in pressure with respect to density times a change in density plus blah, blah, blah. If it's isentropic, this term goes. And then we look at this and we say, ah, uh, that looks familiar. That recalled the definition of the speed of sound. So we then include that with our uh, mass and ener I mean, energy and entropy equations. We get a relation. We finally go back and include conservation of mass. So it's, it's mass, it's energy, it's entropy with the definition of the speed of sound. And you rearrange an algebra, and there you go, QED. That's what we set out to derive. Looks pretty abstract, doesn't it? But we already talked about the real practical application of this equation. There's some other equations that we need to come to grips with, and it's the stagnation temperature equation, that's T naught, and the stagnation pressure equation, P naught. So if I just take the flow, whether it's subsonic or supersonic, now we can work both cases, and I bring it to rest, or if I start from rest, I will have the stagnation temperature and the stagnation pressure. Often what we do is we think about a large reservoir and it's feeding a nozzle that may be converging then diverging. And this is T naught and P naught. That's one way to think about the stagnation pressure and temperature. When you see stagnation, what does that mean? Kinetic energy is negligible. And so its speed is slow. So somewhere in here, you can also talk about the current stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature, and then you can compare it to the actual pressure and the actual temperature. And the actual temperature and the actual pressure will be changing. But what's not going to change? The stagnation pressure and the stagnation temperature. Another way to think of it is you could think about putting a little probe, a little hook-shaped probe. Maybe you've already had fluid mechanics. What's that little hook-shaped probe? What's the name of it that you put into a flow? A pitot tube. And what about the tip of that pitot tube? What about the flow velocity at the tip of the pitot tube? It's the stagnation point. So you could think, oh, I could go in and I could measure T naught and P naught. But it's a little tricky if you put a pitot tube in and it's supersonic. <laughs> you may get some shocks. But conceptually, the stagnation pressure and the stagnation temperature work. Subsonic is a lot easier to put it in conceptually and it works. Okay, now where did these equations come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here they go. <laughs> so what we do is we want to derive this equation, and we can see that it's a function of the Mach number and the K. So you start off with the conservation of energy. What's constant is some sort of stagnation enthalpy. And as you speed up, the H has got to go down such the combination is always equal to H naught. Using that equation in constant specific heats, you just rearrange so you have T naught, the definition of the stagnation temperature, the actual temperature, and the speed for the actual kinetic energy. We go back and we say, what was our Mach number defined as? Speed of sound is square root of KRT for ideal gas. This equation is only good, ideal gas, constant specific heats. You can see that with the K right there. And you rearrange and boom, you get the equation. It's algebra. I'm giving you a fast derivation, aren't I? Would you like to know about the other one? It's even simpler, because if you believe this equation, then you just recall isentropic process, constant specific heat. You just combine these two, and you get the last equation. We're done for derivations of equations. OK? So let's jump on. Oh, I could ask a couple of questions. Can the physical pressure, let's think about flow in a converging, diverging nozzle. Can the physical pressure ever be greater than the stagnation pressure? Isentropic flow in a converging, diverging nozzle. No, no. The equation won't give it. It'll always be less. All right. How about the, the physical temperature? Can it be greater than the stagnation temperature? So both of these are no. And you can see it from the equations. All right. Now, uh, the ambient pressure has a big effect on what the shape of the flow coming out of the nozzle. This is the easy case right here, where the ambient pressure out here matches the exit pressure of the nozzle. But if it's uh, 
different. Here they're showing that the exit pressure is a little greater, that it's going to want to fan out as it comes out. True? All right. And if it's, uh, if the, uh, uh, you can get some oblique shocks when the ambient pressure is a bit more than the nozzle flow pressure, this is a little higher, then you can get some shocks come out. And if it's a lot more, the shocks can move inside and not just be confined to the exit. And now you'll get more of a diamond shape. Isn't that the, what the case we saw in the NASA illustration? So what's happening is, is your ambient pressure is too high. You've designed a nozzle, but you're probably going to hit some high altitude, low pressure, and it'll, it'll uh, have a different shape of the exit exhaust. Um, there's more to be studied about shocks. There's normal shocks and oblique shocks. Those are the two shocks, but let's just say that there's a discontinuity across it. There's a dis For a very small zone, you have an abrupt change in pressure, abrupt change in temperature, and an abrupt increase in entropy, highly irreversible. So we don't want to apply our isentropic equations across a shock. That would be a travesty. Wrong. All right. Here's another one. This is uh, a military aircraft taking off at, at the surface. I'm sure it's designed at high altitudes, to, but as you're taking off, you have some shocks and it forms these diamonds that come off in the, in the material. And here they're trying to show you that this uh, structure of these diamond shocks is not trivial. It's just not trivial. But uh, uh, you have a bunch of points and triple points and shocks interfacing with another shock. Okay. Okay. Um, I have more videos on this about the effects of converging, the back pressure on converging, diverging nozzles. Uh, basically, if you take a look at the pressure going like this, and you start to increase the flow rate through the system, you'll get to a point where the pressure goes First of all, start with the pressure back here is the stagnation pressure, huge, okay? And so here's P naught, all right? Anywhere in the thing when you're flowing, will it ever go below, will it ever go above P naught? No, it won't. But what we do is we start to boost or drop the, the um, discharge pressure, the ambient pressure over here, the pressure ambient. So think about constructing an experiment. You put... I don't know, 10 bar here, or 10 atmospheres or something, uh, 10 atmospheres here. And you put 10 atmospheres here. True? Uh, 10 and 10, is there any flow? No. What's the pressure everywhere through the system? P naught. Now we drop it to 9.9. .9. Drop it to 9.8. Drop it to 9.5. What are we doing? We're dropping the back pressure on the exit. Uh, how could you do it? Well, you just have a vented out with a valve and you partially open it. And so you could see how you're conceptually dropping it. Well, the flow will start to go through it, won't. As it goes through it, you're going to pick up a pressure distribution like this. It would come down and it would go back up. That would be all subsonic. It didn't get into Mach number of one. You drop it a little more pressure, you could get it to be right here. And that pressure would be the pressure at which the flow is now choked. They would call that like P asterisk. It's choked in the throw. Now, if you were like a skosh right below being choked, let's say 0 0.99999 for the Mach number, what's going to happen when you start to get larger area? It'll continue to be a nice diffuser. So it would it would go like that through the throat. I'm trying to line this up here. Okay, But let's say you drop the pressure a little bit more, and then what's going to happen? It's going to want to go supersonic as you start to come out. But it won't be able to stay supersonic for the whole nozzle. So a little bit will be supersonic. Then the complicated part of life is it will go through a shock, and then it will be subsonic. Drop the pressure a little more. Well, it'll go further. Supersonic. But it was not enough to get out to the end. 
it'll go through a shock, it'll go subsonic, like that. And, and I forget that I need to continue to drop this pressure over here. So it's going to be dropped and then come out there, okay? I need to be dropping that exit pressure. Here's the end of it. Well, what happens is, is you can get it to be where you're perfectly matching, no shock. And then actually you can even get it lower. I need to lower my y-axis. How's that? <laughs> And then you'll have another type of shock. So you could have a pressure gain shock or no shock or pressure loss shock. It's too complicated for the 20 minutes that I have. Okay? But hopefully this piques your interest if you're interested. There's, there's a lot of engineering in it. Let's solve this homework problem. Did you solve it? So we skip this one? Go to the next one? You turned it in. Did you use this table? You can do it completely with equations, or you can also do it with the table. This table, let me do this. I'm going to give you two minutes or three minutes, maybe five on this table, as if you've never seen it. This is the Mach number as you go down. What is special about a Mach of 1? Sonic. Speed of sound, right? Okay. What is special about the Mach number of 0? Stagnation. It's stagnant. Stagnation, right? Stagnation point. Okay. And then over here, we all have supersonic, and this is subsonic. So we have our range. Make sure we get that. Now, what about the next column? We have the actual temperature divided by the stagnation temperature. What is it at the top? What is the first entry? one with zero 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 right so does this number ever go above one no and that's one of the questions we just answered that the actual physical temperature is always less than the stagnation temperature throughout no matter if you hit sonic and then continue on or what how about this column p over p naught what is p naught stagnation pressure so the ratio is one at zero Mach and then does it ever go above one it always goes below right and then what is this a asterisk you read the textbook what is a asterisk it's the area for choke flow so you're normalizing the area to the choked flow the area which is the throat so notice that at one what is that area ratio so maybe conceptually work backwards and so it's larger area if it's a lower Mach number approaching and then getting one in the throat as well as work forward in the supersonic region or maybe you just think of a huge area, that's the stagnation area, it's where it's zero speed, and now I'm going to flow it into, but probably think this way, go backwards. Now this is a very interesting table. Are there a lot of numbers on this table? Yes. Is there one number that is really, really, really important that you could actually use for the rest of your life if you could just recognize that one number, the most important number on this table? Yes, there's one number I really want you to remember for the rest of your life on this table. And it's in the middle of the table. It's, it's something where you probably wouldn't recognize it, okay? But let me give you a practical application. Anybody been in a machine shop where they have a compressed air system or in a house where they have a compressed air system and maybe they have a little nozzle and they can use it to blow off stuff off the top or things. So a lot of people have experience with that, right? For those who have experience, can you tell me what typically is the air supply pressure to a tool, let's say an air hammer, air wrench, that are also for, that's the same supply pressure for a nozzle used to blow off and clean workspace. 90, 90 PSI. A lot of times the pressure in the tank will go up, they'll stop, it'll sit. When it goes below 90, the pressure kick, compressor kicks back in and you have a big supply tank. So hopefully when you're running the air tool in the shop and your buddy over there has an air tool running and another person has an air tool running, your supply pressure to your air tool doesn't drop to 40 PSI and then it wimps out on you. True? 
So hopefully you, your, your lines are big enough and everything's 90 PSI. So now think about the supply. You have a little nozzle and you have a little valve so you can turn it on and off. And so, but right here is a little nozzle. Anybody have any experience seeing, you know, little nozzle and they blow off with air? And you could actually just go into the lab somewhere in a machine shop and probably find one and play with it. Now, when this thing blows, okay, assuming that it's not a lot of pressure drop up to right here, what is the pressure drop right before, what is the pressure at the supply to that nozzle? 90 PSI. 90 PSI. Now, the question is, is, is that gauge or absolute pressure? It's gauge. Can you tell me what its pressure is in absolute? Add 15, close enough. I'm going to round off. And it's 105 PSI absolute. All right. We're dumping the air into the ambient room. What's the pressure in the room? It's 15 PSI absolute. You know, 14 point whatever it is. 14 point what? Nine? Yeah, 14.7. Let's round off 15. Close enough, right? Now, when this thing is going, tell me a little bit about what your ears hear. You can hear it. What are your ears hearing? Pressure waves, right? All right. The other was I had to plug a tire this weekend on a friend's trailer I was borrowing. When I pulled the nail out, guess what I could hear? Audibly. You have some experience even with that, maybe. So... Guess how fast that air comes out of that nozzle? It's Mach 1. It's, is that nozzle a converging, diverging nozzle, or typically only a converging nozzle? It's only a converging nozzle. It's not hard to get choked flow in a converging nozzle. And there's a particular number on this table that tells us what that pressure ratio is. Do you see it? You got it. That's it. That's the number. Now, let's round that number off, just like we rounded off 90 PSI and 105 atmospheric. Round that number off to one significant digit. Give me that number. Can you remember that number for the rest of your life? Think about this. So if I have a nozzle... And I have the P1 here is the exit, well, put P2 there, exit pressure. And I have a supply pressure right here, right? With P1 is greater than 2, that's reciprocal of a half, P2, guess what I get for the flow right there, the speed of the flow right there? Mach 1. It's choke flow. Now, I, there's a few things. Don't give me a crummy nozzle. Let me have a nozzle where it's pretty isentropic flow through it, right? Don't give me a cheap nozzle, you know. Let the area converge. That's not too hard to do. And as long as that back pressure is twice the exhaust or ambient pressure you're discharging to, you got choke flow. Isn't this great? You say, hey, Mom, hey, Dad, let's go out in the garage. I'm going to show you choke flow. Here's the air compressor. Little psh, psh, psh. There you go. Isn't that neat? So what happens if uh, the pressure is four times the ambient pressure? Will you throw more air out? Nope. That's exactly right. Isn't that interesting? What happens if it's six times the back pressure? Will you throw more air out? Nope, you will not. So we have an ideal gas expands isentropically through a converging nozzle from a large tank at 800 kilopascal and 350 Kelvin and discharges into a region of 400 kilopascal. First of all, when you see this large tank, what did they give you about this pressure and this temperature? Is that P naught? Is that the key word for large tank? Yeah. And is that T naught? The stagnation, 350? Sure. Okay. And it discharges into a region that's 400 kilopascal. So maybe you would just call that, uh, not P asterisk, let's just call it P for the discharge, uh, 400 kilopascal. 
it's only a converging nozzle, so right away you better not get Mach above one going out. It can be choked, but it can't be above. All right, so um, maybe I draw an illustration. There it is with the pressure out here. Now, um, if this is 400 kilopascal right there, what is the pressure at the exit? Let's call this, I don't know, state one or asterisk or something. Let's call it state one. This is back here, state zero. What is that pressure right there at one? Okay. Can the pressure at one be uh, less than 400, uh, equal to 400, greater than 400? What's our possibilities? Are all three possible? Are only two of the three possible? Is only one of the three possible? So which one's not possible? Isn't that the pressures come out less than 400? Isn't that impossible? All right. When would it come out 400? If and only if? How do you like that? The mathematicians taught me that. IFF. -F. If and only if? What? Mach at the exit is 1. It's choked. All right. Uh, greater than 400? When? It's, it's basically, you would want it to be greater than uh, Mach 1 on the exit, but it can't be, so you get some shocks. You, you, get, sh you get shocks on the exit, so it's higher pressure, but it's still at the throat Mach 1. All right, so this one would be no shocks. All right. Okay. Now they're going to uh, determine the flow rate in kilograms per second for an exit area. So we, ha we have the area here, area equal to 10 centimeters squared. So that's 0 0.0010 meters squared, right? 10 centimeters squared. All right. And then we're going to do it for uh, air. Do it for carbon dioxide, CO2. That's a C, bad looking C, carbon dioxide. And then uh, the last one is argon, AR. They gave us the values of K, 1.4, and C sub P, 1.005 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. K of carbon dioxide is uh, 1.26. And they give us C sub P and C sub V. And the K for the argon, 1.667, and C sub P and C sub V. All right. So we have to run this calculation three times. What is the first thing you want to do? You want to check to see, for, forget about converging, diverging. Like uh, at the end of the previous lecture, I said, you know, this is impossible. This range is impossible because we just assumed it was all isentropic, but it is a choke. So um, do this, calculate the exit uh, temperature, assuming that there is the complete pressure change, so it would be the stagnation um, temperature times the P1, assumed to be 400, divided by P0 to the uh, K minus 1, let me just put K minus 1 over K. And when you calculate it for air, it comes in at 287 Kelvin. Then we can calculate C1. So we find the square root of KRT. And we find that it's 339.6 meters per second. Then we can calculate V1, assuming that it's all converted to C sub P. T naught minus T1, square root, and it comes out at 355.3. Well, I don't even have to do the Mach number. I just compare those. What do I see? It's supersonic, 
That's not possible. So we redo it, and we say that the, the pressure, uh, stagnation pressure divided by P asterisk, which would be the throat um, where it's choked flow, would be 1 plus K minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number squared to the K divided by K minus 1. Put in the M of 1, and you can calculate that P naught divided by P asterisk is 1.89293, or I ran out of room, didn't I? But the P asterisk is 422.6 kilopascal. It's not 400. It's so there's going to be a shock, and there's going to be a pressure drop across that shock at the exit. All right. Now that I know that exit pressure, P1 uh, or P asterisk, I think I'm calling it P asterisk, P1, I can calculate the density. I need to screw it down or forget it. The density at, at the 1, there, let's call it there. And that's going to be the pressure molar mass uh, R T asterisk, and it comes in uh, after calculating the T asterisk of 291.67 Kelvin. This density comes in 5.0487 kilograms per meter cubed. Wow! Finally, I'm getting there. So that the mass flow rate is equal to the rho the area, the velocity, and um, the, uh, the velocity is the speed of sound, square root of KRT, which is uh, 342 meters per second. And so you calculate the mass flow rate 1.728 kilograms per second. That's all for the air. What do we have to do? We just have to update our values of K and C sub P. All right? and then you can get the other three cases. They're not going to be dramatically different. They will be little different, but not dramatically, okay? They're all ideal gases. All right. Thank you for your attention.